everybody. I'm Dr. Angela Valle. I'm an OBGYN, and we're here today to talk about female and fabulous why every woman needs an OBGYN. Now, I know sometimes as a woman, we don't always feel fabulous, especially during certain times of the month or certain times in our life cycle, but we're going to talk about how we get through those times so that we're feeling fabulous as often as possible. Um, I do want to put out there in the beginning, um, you can ask questions, and I do love taking questions via Twitter using UCLA MD chat. So please don't hesitate to ask any questions that come up um, as they arise them and try to answer all of them at the end of this fairly brief overview. So the objectives um, for my talk today are to review what to expect from your OBGYN visit and review screening guidelines by age, in particular screening guidelines for mammograms, pap smears, et cetera. We're going to dispel some myths about what your visit to the OBGYN entails. Um, we're going to explain why an annual exam is more than just a pap smear, especially in regards to some of the new pap smear guidelines that do space out pap smears more than previously. Uh, we're also going to review what kind of medical problems an OBGYN can treat and what treatment options a gynecologist has to offer for those various medical conditions. So we're going to start with our younger age group, ages 13 to 18. Now this is the recommended age for initial um, visit to an OBGYN, and I know to a lot of people that sounds pretty young, but the reason for this is, is this, we really want to catch um, you know, young people before they go to college, before they leave the home, um, because the fact of the matter is more than a quarter of um, teenagers by the age of 17 have engaged in sexual intercourse and our data about the use of contraception and protection during those first episodes of intercourse are often that they're not used at all. So we really want this to be an educational visit, largely to talk about education on the reproductive system, basic anatomy, the better you know your body and you know kind of what's going on, um, the more likely you're going to be to address problems as they arise and go seek help um, and treatment if needed. We're also going to talk about education regarding the menstrual cycle, and it's common irregularities um, in adolescence during these visits. We're also going to screen for normal pubertal development, obviously contraception counseling as needed, um, education on safe sex practices, STD counseling and testing obviously as needed. Um, and often this likely does not include a pelvic exam because as we're going to talk about later, the pap smear guidelines, um, basically you don't need a pap smear t generally until the age of 21. The other thing I don't have on this slide that is important to mention is we probably also want to talk about the Gardasil vaccine. Um, if possibly this has already been discussed with the patient's pediatrician prior, and if that's the case and they've already received the vaccine, great. Um, in case you're not quite sure what the, the Gardasil vaccine is, it is a vaccine against the human papillomavirus, often called HPV. And the reason this virus is important is it's now known to account for most cases of cervical cancer. And so this is a really novel vaccine that can help protect young women from developing cervical cancer in the future. So conditions that we might treat in this age group are um, obviously contraception methods. We're going to counsel, and if needed, we can talk about different birth control methods and prescribe those. Also of note are the IUDs, or um, intrauterine devices, are now recommended for all women, um, regardless of age or pregnancy history. And so these are really good options for young people as well because they're kind of foolproof um, contraception and they last for several years. Uh, we can also discuss issues with your periods, irregular periods, painful periods, and treat that. Um, and if there is any abnormal pubertal development, um, that needs to be treated as well. So moving on from ages 19 to 39, um, we're going to discuss um, just a review of your overall sexual and reproductive health. Once again, this will be ad addressing the menstrual cycle, any menstrual irregularities, um, anything, especially in this age group. A lot. This is um, a largely you know reproductive age group, and so menstrual irregularities that could tip us off to kind of ovulatory dysfunction or things that might tip, um, cause problems with um, fertility in the future. This is a good time to discuss family planning and set goals for when someone may or may not want to become pregnant, and that can kind of help us decide what kind of birth control or plan is best for that particular patient. Um, as we said, just contraception counseling, always STD counseling if the patient is sexually active. 
Um, we also want to start talking about screening for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. This has been in the media quite a bit over the past couple years. Um, it's called the BRCA gene. There's two genes, um, BRCA1 and 2. And this is a genetic hereditary um, syndrome that greatly increases a patient's um, risk for breast and ovarian cancer. And so if we detect a strong family history of these things, um, we can either um, screen the patient or the affected family members to kind of help triage what kind of treatment is, best, is most appropriate for that patient. Um, a routine exam in this age group is a breast exam and a pelvic exam. And, gener and sometimes a pap smear, and I have maybe there because we are going to review the new pap smear guidelines, which are listed here. So as of 2012, these are the new guidelines, and you know I won't, wouldn't be surprised if they change again in the next few years because they're kind of constantly being reevaluated based on new data, particularly in regards to the HPV virus and how we screen for that. Um, so as of now, the first PAP is recommended at age 21, and that's regardless of sexual history or sexual activity. And then from the ages of 21 to 29, it's recommended to have a PAP smear every three years. From the ages of 30 to 65, the preferred screening method for cervical cancer is a PAP smear with the HPV test. So this is called a co-test. And this is because um, a double negative test with a, ne a negative PAP and a negative HPV is a far superior um, screening method than the PAP alone in this age group. And if you do that, you need one every five years. It is also acceptable just to continue with the PAP smears every three years. After the age of 65, we do recommend discontinuation if a few criteria are met. And those are if your last two PAP smears were normal, one of these last pap smears was in the last five years, and you have no history of precancerous changes. So obviously, these are fairly general guidelines, and you're going to have a discussion with your provider um, if you are you know, someone who it's appropriate to follow these guidelines. Obviously, someone with a history of um, cervical cancer with cervical precancer is going to have a different screening regimen um, than someone with a history of normal pap smears. So moving on to condition, conditions that we can treat in this age group of 19 to 39, some common conditions are obviously pregnancy, and hopefully not, but any of its complications, infertility, STDs, abnormal pap smears, menstrual irregularities, fibroids, um, ovarian cysts or tumors, endometriosis, and pelvic pain. So some surgeries that OBGYNs perform to assist in some of those prior conditions are listed here. Um, I want to take a moment to just talk about this diagram that you have here on your slide. So this is just um, a diagram of the different kinds of fibroids that can be found in the uterus. So fibroids are a benign, smooth muscle tumor of the uterus. They're extremely common. Um, greater than 50% of women have fibroids or have had them at some point in their life, and they largely um, do not cause symptoms. In fact, most people probably never knew that they had them because they didn't cause them any problems. However, as some of you may know, um, they can cause heavy bleeding, irregular bleeding. Obviously, if they grow very large, they can cause pelvic pain and pressure. And depending on how big your fibroids are, the location, and the type, the treatment can vary. So, you know, a lot of times the first thing people think of is a hysterectomy, which sometimes is the most reasonable option, but we now have a lot more minimally invasive options um, that can be really attractive to patients um, because, you know, it's a, usually an outpatient surgery and um, recovery is very quick. And one of those examples, a couple of those, um, for example, are hysteroscopy, which is a completely um, it was a surgery done completely vaginally where a small camera is placed into the uterus to remove any um, polyps or fibroids that way. Um, endometrial ablation, if you're just having a lot of bleeding but you don't have hefty fibroids, that's um, a nice option. Um, and then obviously hysterectomy is kind of definitive um, treatment for problems involving the uterus and that can be done abdominally, vaginally, or laparoscopically. Um, we also perform laparoscopies, common, most commonly probably for things like ovarian cysts, ovarian tumors, and then like I said, we now perform um, hysterectomies laparoscopically as well. So moving on to our next age group, ages 40 to 64. 
So you're going to see some similarities in the overview. Obviously, once again, we're going to do an, uh, an overview of your sexual and reproductive health. Um, a lot of times, this is the time in our lives when we start to notice some um, symptoms and changes because of changes in our hormones. Um, you know, average age of menopause is 51. However, there is a large bell curve where there are many people who go several years after that and several years before that. So it does vary. Um, however, these, this dropping in overall estrogen levels from um, decreased ovarian function can obviously cause symptoms such as hot flashes and vaginal dryness, and these are things that we want you to talk to us about because there are treatment for those um, symptoms, um, including you know, a discussion regarding hormone replacement, um, if applicable for that particular patient. Um, we're going to continue the screening for breast, uh, hereditary breast, ovarian, and colon cancers. Um, a breast and pelvic exam is still routine in an annual um, GYN exam. And like we talked about, a uh, pap smear every five years, five years if your co-test is negative. Um, at starting at 40, you're going to get a referral for a yearly mammogram and a referral for colonoscopy at age 50. Obviously, if you have risk factors, um, there's a family history or something like that, you know, you may be referred earlier. So treatment um, for conditions in this age group include pregnancy once again, infertility, contraception, um, abnormal or postmenopausal uterine bleeding. One note on, so oftentimes around menopause or leading up to menopause in a period that we often call perimenopause, um, it's really common to have um, menstrual irregularities. And this is a common finding. However, um, you know, it's never common to have really, really heavy bleeding, to have painful bleeding, and those are the things you really want to tip your provider off to. And then in regards to the postmenopausal bleeding, so menopause technically is the cessation of periods for a year. And once that's happened, you should really never have bleeding again. And if you do, you really, really want to talk to your gynecologist, gynecologist about this because um, this is kind of a red flag for, um, you know, at worst endometrial carcinoma, um, but there are other benign things that could cause that, all of which need to be evaluated and treated. Um, other treatment um, plans are for hot flashes, vaginal atrophy, abnormal pap smears. Oftentimes, um, we start to hear more about, you know, urinary issues, urinary frequency, incontinence, um, that sort of thing that we can address, and um, pelvic organ prolapse. Pelvic organ prolapse is when um, parts of the vagina or uterus start to drop down into the vaginal canal or possibly all the way out of the body. Um, and there are most definitely treatments for this condition. In our last age group, ages 65 and older, um, at that visit, we're going to really want to do an overview of your sexual health. It's really important. I think a lot of times it's, um, sexual health is not often discussed in this age group, which is really a shame because um, it continues to be an important part of someone's life. And if there are any issues, we should really try to address them and fix them. Um, we're going to discuss any menopausal symptoms that are ongoing. Um, especially in the particularly elderly um, screening for neglect and abuse because the elderly are at increased risk um, for these things, unfortunately. Um, we're continuing to do a breast exam and a pelvic exam. As we mentioned, if the pap smear history has been normal, likely not a pap smear. Um, we're going to keep doing screening mammography until the age of 75. This is not a definitive guideline. This is something we'll discuss with you, and you know, based on your history and your wishes, we'll kind of tailor um, mammography um, screening for, your, um, for that particular patient. And then referral for bone density studies is um, recommended at age 65. This is also called a DEXA scan. You may have heard of that. And this is kind of to capture people who are at increased risk for fracture um, and see if they should be started on some kind of medication to help prevent that. I said 65, but obviously, once again, if there are risk factors, um, such as a family history of a severe fracture, if um, the patient is a smoker or um, a heavy drinker, <clears throat> those might be indications that they should be referred earlier for a um, bone density study. And obviously, if the patient themselves has already suffered a fracture before the age of 65, this needs to be analyzed then. 
So common um, treatments um, or conditions that we treat in the ages of 65 and older, um, vaginal atrophy. What is vaginal atrophy? So this is a common condition after menopause that is caused by a decrease in estrogen in the vaginal tissues and it leads to vaginal dryness, vaginal sensitivity, irritability. Um, it causes the tissues to be very sensitive and prone to breakage, um, perhaps like during intercourse if there's not enough lubrication and that sort of thing. And there is treatment for that. Um, hot flashes, once again, once again, I mentioned here postmenopausal bleeding because I just really don't want people to ignore that sign. Um, of every woman after menopause who has bleeding, only about 10% on, on evaluation will be found to have endometrial carcinoma. But that's not that small of a percentage. And like I said, um, you really want to catch, obviously, any kind of cancer, especially endometrial, because when caught early, it is relatively easy to treat and the cure rate is very high. Um, pelvic organ prolapse. So. Basically, there are two treatment methods for that, and that's once again, this, as in this diagram here, is where you can see the uterus is essentially um, prolapsing out of the vagina so that it can actually be seen externally. This is a more severe um, kind of prolapse, um, and you can have symptoms even when it's not this severe, so you know, have it evaluated. However, um, there are surgical and non-surgical options. A pessary is essentially uh, what appears to be a plastic apparatus. There are different shapes and sizes that gets fitted to your particular pelvis to kind of help elevate whatever's prolapsing out. Um, that is something then that for treatment would need to stay in as long as you wanted relief from those symptoms. Um, surgery is the other option, and there are various types of surgery. Um, depending on how severe your prolapse is, you'll likely be referred to something called a urogynecologist who specializes in um, surgery for pelvic organ prolapse. And once again, urinary incontinence. There are two different kinds of urinary incontinence, urge and stress, and then some lucky or not so lucky few have mixed where they have components of urge and stress incontinence. Stress is the kind people think about probably the most, which is when you leak urine after coughing, sneezing, or laughing. Um, and <clears throat> there are surgical treatments for that, as well as some behavioral treatments as well. So we're kind of drawing towards the end here. So in conclusion, obviously gynecological care varies by age. These guidelines of kind of the way we treat um, different age groups varies by age, depending on the recommended guidelines for various um, screening modalities. Um, there are so many options now to treat different gynecological ailments. You know, it used to just be kind of hysterectomy for all or birth control pills for all, and now we just have so many things to offer you that a lot of people don't even know about. So definitely come in, talk to us, and we're going to be happy to kind of share with you all of these kind of more um, novel, a lot, oftentimes minimally invasive options that can be really um, great for patients. Um, one thing I always like to tell patients and remind is like, don't be afraid to discuss your sexual health. You know, if you're not going to discuss it with anyone, you know, it, it should be the gynecologist at the very least because that's what we're here for. That's what we want to help you with. Um, we're comfortable discussing those issues, and so please don't hesitate to um, bring it up. And lastly, receiving um, routine preventative care is paramount, paramount to good health. A bottom line, preventative care saves lives. So come in, get your yearly checkup. Even if it's been a long time, we're not going to give you a hard time about it. There's no shame in that you've gone a few extra years without getting that pap smear or pelvic exam. The important part is that you come in, and we're happy to see you at any time. So thank you very much for your time. Um, I believe there's some questions that I'm going to start taking. Thank you. All right, and once again, this is the um, Twitter that you can, any additional questions. Okay, so first, oh, this is a really good first question. If you have had a hysterectomy, do you still need a pap smear? Great question. By and large, the answer is no, as long as the indication for your hysterectomy was not cervical cancer or cervical precancer. So if that's the case, you do continue to get pap smears. But if you had a hysterectomy for abnormal bleeding, fibroids, pelvic pain, pressure, um, you, and, and you've had a history of normal pap smears in the past, you do not need to get pap smears ever again. Um, I am 60 years old and I've been told by my doctor that I don't need a pap every year, that every few years. Is that true? 
So definitely, as we discussed in the new pap smear guidelines from the ages of 30 to 65, um, it's if you're just getting the pap, uh, only a pap every three years, and if you're getting the co-test, which is the pap smear with the um, HPV test, that's every five years. Next question is, should women entering menopause ever be concerned about having fibroids, or just be patient and wait until the fibroids shrink and melt away? So. That's a good question as well. So if you're someone who has symptomatic fibroids, for instance, meaning they either are causing you some kind of pelvic pain or um, irregular menses, it can kind of be, this is a really patient dependent um, kind of conversation because it is true that once you've technically reached full menopause, your bleeding will absolutely stop. Um, and over time, the fibroids will start to shrink. Um, however, it does take some time. So for instance, if your symptoms are mainly that you have a big bulky uterus from your fibroids, you know, it's not maybe the best idea to just think everything's gonna go away with menopause if you think menopause is a year out because like I said, it's not like they shrink up automatically. It could take many, many years after menopause for you to have any kind of relief or possibly never. So I would really consider pursuing treatment. If it's bleeding, obviously any really heavy bleeding, regardless of how close to menopause you are, probably warrants treatment. Um, you know, bleeding to the point of needing blood transfusions and that sort of thing is dangerous. However, if it's more just causing slightly heavier periods but no anemia or slightly irregular periods, but otherwise you're not having pain or any other really um, major symptoms, then I do think waiting is a reasonable option. But once again, talk to your provider and just see kind of where you fall and how bothersome your symptoms are and how much you would want to avoid a surgical procedure or treatment. And you know, once again, there are also medical um, treatment options for heavy bleeding. Sometimes they don't work as well when the cause of your bleeding is fibroids, but um, sometimes they can work a little bit. So it's just something to really talk to your doctor about. All right, next. How can an OBGYN make it easier for a rape or sexual abuse survivor to get through a routine screening exam? What's the best thing such a patient can do to prepare for, prepare for this appointment? Yeah, this can be, you know, definitely a really hard situation. Um, for our patients who have, you know, had this kind of um, abuse history, obviously these exams can be more uncomfortable than for everybody else um, to even being traumatic just because of kind of that history. Um, so there's a couple things. One, you want to, first of all, you want to let your provider know because obviously then we are going to do everything possible to put you at ease to make this as comfortable as possible for you because, you know, let's admit having a pelvic exam is not, you know, anyone's idea of a fun time. And so we're gonna wanna know that ahead of time so that we can you know, talk to you. Um, maybe we don't do it at that first visit. Maybe we want to you know, establish a rapport with you so that you feel comfortable with us. So you know, it's almost never as a, a pelvic exam and urgent if you're coming in for just pre preventative care. Maybe you come in and you get to know us and then you know, once, we, you know, once you feel comfortable and then we can kind of schedule it. If having um, a family member or something in the room would make it more comfortable, comfortable for you, definitely that would be not a problem at all. Um, and so, you know, and then I think in preparation for the day, I mean, I think that's really hard. I think, um, you know, if, for instance, if it's more of it that it seems to cause a lot of pain, obviously you could take some kind of pain medication beforehand. If it causes um, extreme anxiety um, for you, I do think that's something, once again, to talk to your provider beforehand, and it's a possibility to kind of prescribe kind of um, just a short course of anti-anxiety medication just to get you through the exam, especially if we think it's really important for whatever reason that you, know, that you do need the pelvic exam, especially if you're having symptoms or abnormal vaginal discharge or pain or something like that. So, um, just talk to your provider, try to find somebody you're really comfortable with, and like I said, we'll go to great lengths to do whatever we can to make it a comfortable uh, exam for you. Um, question, is it okay to have sex the night before my OBGYN appointment? Um, generally, yes. Um, if you're coming in just for a preventative exam and you don't have any complaints, um, yeah, it doesn't really change um, the exam at all. Usually pap smears can still be done and still be satisfactory. Um, if 
at all you could wait if, if you don't want to risk at all the chance of having uh, an unsatisfactory pap smear. Um, maybe put it off for one day. <laughs> but overall, I wouldn't cancel your appointment because of it. Next question. I sometimes have spotting in between my periods. Is this normal? What could it be? So it can be normal, um, but you should talk to your provider about this. So for instance, something a common history that can be um, a pretty normal history is um, someone who, and this happens more often for someone who's not on the birth control pill, but it still can, we, we still see it sometimes, is um, it's always right in the middle of your cycle around day 12 to 14, something like that where all of a sudden you have a couple spots of bleeding, maybe you even feel a twinge of pain, it goes away, your spotting goes away, and that just happens every month. And what most likely that is, it's something called ovulatory bleeding, and that um, little, little bit of spotting and pain is from actual ovulation, which some people are sensitive to. Um, most patients don't feel it and don't spot, but um, this is something that we see. Um, however, um, it could be, especially if it's just very random, you spot just here and there several times during the month, not related to your um, menses, then definitely talk to your doctor about it because there are things like fibroids, polyps um, in the uterus or cervix or something like that um, that could be causing the bleeding, especially if the bleeding is after intercourse, which is what we call postcoital bleeding. In that case, we really you want to have your cervix evaluated and make sure there's nothing abnormal going on there. Um, sometimes I have large clots during my period. Is this something I should talk to my OBGYN about? Yeah, I think so. You know, the normal range of what's a normal period and an abnormal period is pretty subjective. So some people just have heavier menses than other, and particularly if it's just whatever, that, first, that second day is your heaviest, you always have a, a clot, and, but you know, it lasts five days, it's over. It's probably okay, however, Anytime someone's bleeding to the point of making clots, you definitely want to at least talk to your provider about it. Once again, do you have fibroids? Do you have something that's causing you to bleed more than we'd like you to? And last question. I usually see my primary care doctor for my health issues. Why is it better to see an OBGYN? So I think for someone who is absolutely healthy without any um, complaints, especially in regards to their gynecological gynecological care, um, I think your primary care doctor is more than adequate. Obviously, they can absolutely do pap smears, they can prescribe contraception and that sort of thing. Um, I think the difference in not exactly the way, you know, it's not a better pelvic exam or a better pap smear, it's that I think we do have a little bit more experience sometimes with the more newer forms of contraception and we're more comfortable with um, placement of those kinds of things, such as all the different kinds of IUDs, knowing that you know a new IUD actually just came out um, last year, um, similar to the Mirena. We know how to put in something called Nexplanon, which is a kind of contraception that goes in the upper arm that oftentimes um, other providers kind of don't know about or can't offer because they don't know how to place it. So I just think for a, full, a fuller breadth of options regarding treatment, um, contraception, that sort of thing, it, might you know be a good thing to see a gynecologist, but once again, if you're complaint free, just getting your paps, you're happy with whatever you know, birth control pills or nothing or whatever, um, I think your primary care doctor is um, definitely adequate as well. And that is my last question. So I want to thank everybody who participated by sending in questions, and um, yeah, I mean, please um, contact us if you need to be seen by a GYN. So have a good day.